to the state of UI, the, the Blender today for user interface module, not just the UI. Uh, we're going to talk a bit of the organization of the module itself. People here, people online, people who are not even aware that they're part of the module, but they help so much that they're considered one and we rely on them. And uh, everyone else uh, contributing with uh, bug reports, with talks at Blender conferences or in any uh, way or form. So um, we're going to talk of, we're going to be switching constantly, so hope it goes well. Um, but we're going to talk about about what happened since last Blender conference. Was anybody here at last year's Blender conference, State of UI? Okay, cool. That's uh, You're going to get a little bit of, a, of an update and for everyone else, everything is new. So, cool. The When, when we were preparing this talk, we, okay, what is, what has been, how has, has happened since the previous conference. And putting it together is like, oh, it doesn't sound like much as a one year, but actually <laughs> last Blender conference, Blender 4 wasn't even out. So this, uh, what we're gonna show, is actually involved 4.0, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. <laughs> Maybe there is some something in there. So a year of polishing. What does it mean with polishing? Polishing. How can you polish a 31-year-old software, right? <laughs> um, the, yeah, there are many ways. Uh, sometimes the polishing is a bit beyond what uh, just moving one pixel, you know, aligning the sub-pixel alignment that you do on icons, for example, <laughs> uh, which are amazing. But I actually got someone uh, uh, reach out to me and saying that, saying like, thanks, Harley, I haven't met him, but uh, for this one pixel alignment, Leon also doing those. Leon pixel perfect alignments, but also it's about the interface, about the how do you interact with um, with your everyday widgets or how you don't interact. For example, um, recently, such as today, there has there was this presentation <laughs> over here, which as you can see, um, so we are there, right in the middle regarding, but the best in the industry is like not that far off. I mean, we're halfway, a bit halfway, more than halfway than the whole like extremely easy, but no one is extremely easy. So Blender, well, <laughs> Blender's user interface, we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting there, uh, but um, it's not as bad as it used to be, I think, I believe, because I mean, somehow people are learning it and people who have been using it for 20 plus years, they're still there, they're still hanging out, so it works. And sometimes it it's just not, um, sometimes it's, it's addressed like UI, but it's actually, many other modules. This could be mo the modeling module, the, I don't know, UV is the same module, but um, video sequencer module, like uh, texture painting. Today is gonna, we're going to talk about brush assets, which was done by people in the module, UI module, but also um, that's the assets pipeline. No, texture, paint, sculpt, grease pencil, grease pencil. <laughs> everything uh, module. So sometimes it's a bit out of the, the scope. But let's see what has changed since the previous Blender conference. Do you want to do a they know you. No, they don't. <laughs> so, I am Harley. I'm Harley Atchison um, from Canada. Been contributing for 14 years now. Um, employed by Blender for the last year and a half. Uh, Western Canada. You get to Vancouver, go off the coast even farther, take a ferry. You're at my home in Vancouver Island. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jonas uh, <laughs> from France. From France. <laughs> I work as a software pipeline developer uh, at Autour de Minuit mm -hmm. in Paris and I'm um, a UI volunteer, I guess, and uh, a macOS platform partner now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Max stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, Max stuff. <laughs> I'm Julian. I'm a Blender developer, working full time since five years, but I have uh, like 10 years, more than 10 years ago, I think, I started working as a developer. Um, and it, my focus has always been on usability aspects. Um, yeah, I'm from Germany and I'm living in the Netherlands since five years. Yeah. I'm Hans. Uh, my involvement in the UI has mainly been restricted to code reviews and participating in meetings the last year, but um, I'm often in and out of lots of different UI topics. So, yeah. Because your involvement in other modules, so. <laughs> Yeah, the, that's the thing with the UI module is like we're a bit all over uh, the place and spread into other uh, modules as well. 
And okay, I'm, I'm Pablo, I didn't <laughs> introduce myself, Pablo, I'm uh, involved in the UI module, but like part-time, sometimes less than part-time, trying to make it more often recently. Um, but um, you're gonna, we're gonna see how actually that has been improved since last uh, Blender conference. Um, we're gonna go a bit of, uh, okay, features, features. What happened, what happened? This oh, okay. You're, you did this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the thing. Uh, we're now collapsing um, wide lists to single columns. Uh, which helps if you have a, a, I don't know, limited space on a, a laptop, say. Um, we're now adding, uh, this mentions rules, but that means uh, horizontal and vertical lines that can break up the interface. Uh, what else is? We recently made a big change that you won't really notice, and that we changed our, um, our icon processing from um, exported bitmaps to directly rasterizing SVGs in the interface. Um, at the exact size that you're wanting. So we can now make the interface any size we want. And it should, the icon should look perfect or as close to perfect no matter the size. Um, we have support for color now, although not much use for color. But we, uh, even things like the, um, that little red record button in the timeline, that's two colors. Because with these new icons, we can um, theme the internal parts of the SVG. So in that case, it's a red themed thing with the text color around it, right? So we'll probably introduce more color as we need it, still keeping the interface mostly monochrome. Um, uh, we had a lot of contributions um, to converting the tool icons also to SVGs. Uh, the response, I asked for help because they were taking so long. I asked for help and people just jumped in and did hours of work to help us out. And uh, it was just incredible. Um, yeah, I couldn't tell, uh, you know, thank people enough. That was just awesome. Um, we've tried to help with accessibility this year a bit more too as well, um, mostly with um, people with vision issues. So now we have a, a subtle highlight on the entire active area by default, but somebody with um, low vision can now choose to make the active area be bright or you could have the active area you know, a bright blue and the inactive ones red, or you could choose to not um, highlight either of them. So it'll be like, you know, nice and calm like it is today. Uh, so we're quite proud of that. We wanted that for a long time. The old um, method of highlighting the active area with the header color doesn't really work when that header is transparent. So it was time to get rid of that whole, uh, whole idea. The, um, uh, Moving of edges, like to size the areas, we've now made that a bit more visible as well. Again, mostly for uh, people with low vision uh, to show that contrast as you're moving things. Um, and as this says, the scaling has all gotten better and uh, better contrast. I made the, um, the area that you have to hit in order to resize the areas wider again, so it should be easier to hit with a, a, a tablet pen. It's about as wide as I can make it now, though. So if you still have problems, let me know and we'll think of something else. <laughs> uh, this year, uh, we try to make all the, um, the dialogues and confirmations a bit more helpful and um, consistent with each other. So just about all of the um, you know, are, you know, okay question mark uh, confirmations are gone, replaced with things that are uh, a bit more useful. And um, all the pop-up uh, confirmations and dialogues have a cancel now, which makes a bit more sense. And Overall, just trying to make things a bit more um, normal. <laughs> the, um, we added search to most of the menus. That was a bit difficult to um, actually get in. There was a lot of uh, growing pains with that. So, but most menus now, you can either search by just typing, and it'll search automatically. Otherwise, the other ones, you hit spacebar to search any menu. Uh, and that includes submenus as well. So you can, I don't know, be on the recent list, hit spacebar search just your recents, like uh, that was a nice change. Um, a less noticeable change is that the, uh, all the menus are now popping down in a consistent manner. They'll no longer pop up if it's near the bottom. Like these, well, they would pop up and reorder the items. It's like, no, we've <laughs> finally fixed that. Um, we've also added um, zoom menus to most of the um, editors that have a zoom level, like the um, image editor. Uh, so it'll show you the 
current Zoom level and um, all the options in a consistent manner. We've added um, sort of better previews wherever we can. So if you uh, highlight to, or hover to get a, a tooltip, we're now showing uh, images and previews in those tooltips. Uh, where we can, we'll show you, like this shows the uh, resolution, but movie, um, like video codecs will be shown. Uh, maybe the Blender version will be shown. Uh, we're trying to be as helpful as we can. You know, wherever you see the data, show as much information as we can. Uh, we added a new um, pop-up preview for colors as well. So if you hover over a little tiny you know, color button, it'll pop up to show you a, a nice larger um, uh, display with you know, the RGB values and such. Uh, same with the open recent. Yeah, if you go to the open recent list now, it'll not only show you the, um, a thumbnail of that uh, blend file, but it'll also show you the, um, the version that it was created in. That's about it. This is a bit less interesting. The, um, we changed the format for the, um, the main uh, window title bar to now include the, uh, the Blender version. So if you're running, running multiples, it helps a little bit when you, you know, minimize them on a, ta on a task bar. You can tell which one's which. So having this, uh, you know, as it shows the 4.30 beta there is a change. Um, individual floating windows now are, have if there's just one editor in them, we'll have a title showing the proper editor. It'll change to just say Blender if you were to split that properties window. But this also helps out when uh, you have multiple windows loaded. You can see which is which on the taskbar a bit better. Docking is a big thing that we added very recently. And I'm not sure how many people have actually tried it yet. It, it's hard to describe it well. Can you? Show them, maybe? <laughs> of course, show off. I happen to have a blender right here with a beautiful render. And uh, okay, now let's, let's the, the typical thing. So you start, you open blender. All right, can you see it? Cool. So how do you, um, in 3.6, ancient blender, how do you even get the outliner to the other side? You would probably like split the viewport in two, right? And then like, for example, you would, uh, I think you can still do it. You split this, you go here, you go to the outliner, or you would swap the outliner with the 3D viewport and then like so many steps, right? Not anymore. You can simply just drag it here and look, it's there. It's amazing. Thank you. Put it back here. Or you can grab it back to the same place and either take the whole space or put it somewhere there. And it snaps to halfway even. It's amazing. And with the mouse, so much easier. <laughs> Sorry, I'll tap. Oh, sure. Can I go back? Yeah. I mean, this not only lets you move things from any location to any other, this also works, um, see, to create a new window, just drag the area out of the window. It'll make a, a new one for you. Then you can drag between those windows as well. A natural thing that people are going to mention when they, I talk about this, though, is that Rational people hate those little four hidden zones, right? So this, this helps people who use those four corner zones for maintenance, but this is more of a gift for the people who don't use them. In, until this change, the four zones worked in four different ways. Like, we don't think about it, but the, how the split works was different on the top left versus the top right, right? You could only join two areas if you use the the, um, those little zones between the two neighbors, right? With this change, all four little zones operate identically. You could do any operation from any of them, okay? This, again, doesn't sound like much, but it means that you could, um, you can now set a shortcut to this, op this one operator and not have to use them at all. You could just hit your shortcut key, move your mouse a little bit to uh, do a, a split or a merge or a, a tearing off. Like you can do it all you know, like with, with one thing. And doing it from one thing is important for us. Like we, we, 
haven't been able to show these four corners, like these frustrating four corners have been hidden because we don't want to show them all. Like you might want to have a, a gripper or something, but I don't want to put a gripper on all four corners, right? Now they all work the same. We have that option now. We could explore the idea of having one visible one. We could explore the idea of having one visible one and remove all the others. We could um, do all those operations by dragging the, um, the area header instead, or tabs maybe one day. Like We can all do these operations from one location now. That's like really the big change that's for anybody who doesn't use these corner zones. For everybody else, you know, drag all you want. Text editor, uh, some changes happened. Um, we now have auto closing brackets as a, um, an option. Uh, it's in preferences. Uh, GLSL syntax highlight highlighting is new this year as well. Um, and dragging text from other applications directly into the text editor um, will uh, move the text or links. Uh, you can drag from outliner to uh, the text editor and it'll put the path there and, uh, and the name of the object. Uh, a few small changes. Outliner. Also, lots of little tweaks. Um, dragging, dropping, dragging and dropping between windows is quite nice now. It'll work between multiple windows. Um, it works better with hierarchies. You can just double click an item and it'll select all of the, all of the children. Uh, we can now apply modifiers within the, within the outliner. Um, Blender file mode now shows uh, all the user counts, so it's not just um, you know that orphan file mode where you can see what things would be deleted. Here you're seeing actual um, uh, user counts. We will probably extend that further to allow more maintenance later, because um, yeah, user counts is a whole thing. Um, image editor, we can now rotate images by 90, 90 degree in increments. Um, the vector scope drawing was improved a lot. That's, yeah, so fast, so pretty now. <laughs> and the uh, note about copying and pasting um, uh, images between applications in Blender, uh, it now works in Mac OS and uh, Wayland. It was in for uh, Windows last year, but that's, yeah, a nice change. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Mac OS. Uh, Mac OS got a few improvements. Uh, some of them were catching up on Features that were present on other OSs, some, are, some were um, more OS specific. Uh, the very first one we have is uh, a special warning to when I get tuning Blender to Rosetta. So as some of you may know, uh, Macs are slowly moving to a new architecture, uh, which is ARM-based, which they call uh, Apple Silicon. And they still let you run all binaries from Intel but the thing is that if you do run an Intel binary on an Apple Silicon Mac, you will get heavily reduced performance. But before this, you wouldn't get a warning. You would just run the thing and performance would be destroyed and you wouldn't know. So now we get a warning, which is pretty useful, especially since um, right now it doesn't have much uses, but uh, in the future, um, people may um, switch from an Intel-based Mac to an ARM-based Mac, and especially on macOS, you can migrate all your application to your new Mac, and uh, in that sense, it's way better that you know that you need to update Blender this way, and in that sense, also, uh, this was backported to 4.2 LTS. Mm. Um, we got also image editor copy-pasting, uh, which uh, same as Windows, and this also supports image files, um, unlike Windows and Wayland, which up until, well, currently only supports raw image data, uh, this does introduce some feature <laughs> non-parity, but uh, Harley very nicely made a patch to bring this the ability to not only <laughs> copy raw image data, but also files to Windows, which hopefully will end soon. And we also got a uh, colored window title bar, uh, which I'll talk a bit later in the next slide. <laughs> and internal system backend refactors, that's not that interesting, but uh, mainly the um, uh, aging macOS code was given a bit of a refresh. And we got also got install most cursor of dragging and docking, which you might have seen uh, during the docking presentation, but that's thanks to Ali. 
uh, kudos to him. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> thanks. So, uh, the client said we in the decoration APIs. Uh, this is a pretty technical topic, but uh, to put it pretty simply, uh, window decorations are anything that's not your main application. So that's like window title bar, window uh, controls, or your closing buttons and stuff. And client side window decoration is when uh, the client, so like the application Blender in this case, uh, modifies them to, its, to adapt it to its liking. So uh, over the summer, I worked on implementing a new client side window decoration API so that Blender can access uh, client side decorations uh, on a pairwise basis. I won't go too much into detail here about how it works, but basically we can define decorations. And one initial decoration was implemented, which is the color data bar. And then OSCs can implement the decoration to match which, uh, each different platform, which is quite different. But right now we got uh, the color title bar, which um, is still experimental for now, but should land soon upon in 4.4. Uh, and uh, this lets Blender seamlessly blend with which, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> its title bar. Um, which gives it a nice and unified look and does help bridge um, the fact that blend, the Blender UI is not really unified with the macOS UI, but this nicely makes it all more unified as you can see in the GIF. And Harley very nicely also started working on a Windows um, port to the um, color title bar decorations, uh, which you can Windows see. Windows 11 only. Yes, Windows yeah. 11 only indeed. And this should also all land soon, of course. And uh, color picker um, This was uh, pretty long in the making, but I'm glad it made it in for 4.3. Um, the main idea was that looking at the color picker here, what you can, at the old color picker, I, uh, I mean, you can see that uh, you typically switch fairly often between um, a color mode, so that like RGB or HSV, and the X mode, but you don't really often switch between RGB and HSV all the time. So to reduce back and forth and make everything nicer and um, all of this, uh, hex was given its own spot at the bottom of the color picker, which makes everything more horizontally uh, organized. Uh, the eyedropper icon now nicely fits in next to the hex. Uh, part and uh, we also now got alpha in the X field, so you can copy colors with alpha. Yeah. Um, uh, future color widget. This is kind of a sneak peek. Uh, this uh, is still experimental, <coughs> and well, this is not a market. This is a functional demo, but uh, it's not in Blender yet. Uh, on the top side, we can see an editor <laughs> color drag and drop support. So um, color drag and dropping color buttons was uh, possible in Blender before, although not that one known. Uh, but now you can drop them in the node editor and make RGB nodes. And also before alpha was not supported, uh, you couldn't drop, uh, when, if you try to drop a color with alpha between color buttons, that wouldn't work. Uh, this has been as added in. And the, um, uh, also have an experiment for improving the <coughs> RGB color node layout, uh, which still requires some more back-end work uh, for multiple reasons, mainly uh, improving the color picker first so that they can all check out, but <laughs> this is way too technical. And this should hopefully all come soon. No promises on dates, but it will come one day, hopefully. And this is highly spot. Aha, this is just showing more um, uh, informational tool tips, mostly. Um, we do have a, a allowing a, a wider range of zoom in the file browser now. Um, we're also showing uh, a different icon while the previews are loading. That helps a little bit to know whether it's going to load a preview or not. Um, when it's uh, the file browser is in list view, we're now removing columns as the, um, the, the space is reduced. So it, 
doesn't get all jumbled up together. It should re remain useful down to very small sizes. Um, yeah, and no more confirmation when creating a new folder. That was just useless. We, we tried really hard to remove as many uh, dumb confirmations as we, <laughs> we could this year. Uh, although we added a couple more, but mostly removed them. Mostly removed them or improved them. Yeah. Ooh. Very nice. Um, I briefly wanted to mention, um, it is actually pretty nice that we finally have people who, for UI work on all platforms because uh, mostly macOS was lagging behind for the biggest part mm -hmm. uh, in many regards, code quality, but also just usability f features. Uh, so it's really nice that we have no Jonas now who can help us catch a bit up with the macOS stuff. Um, so I think there's going to be more coming there in the future. Um, so I, when I introduced myself, I said that I'm somebody who likes to work on usability things, um, which of course involves the user interface, but uh, I'm also like working on other things that I think are really important for the usability of Blender, so I'm gonna um, talk a bit about the brush assets mostly. Um, I've been working on the asset system for, I don't know, three years now, something like that. Um, and one of the, we, there were a bunch of milestones, a bunch of projects related to that. Uh, and for the last two years, I think, uh, this brush assets project has been going on, not constantly, but um, it's been going on for a while, basically. Um, and now in 4.3, this should all be, this is going to be in the release. <laughs> it's way too late now to get it out again. Um, so I wanted to show you a few things about this. Basically, we just rethought how you're using brushes inside Blender, how your workflow is to uh, customize brushes, to collect your own brushes. Um, and essentially, essentially is a great word. Um, so Blender comes now with a bunch of uh, default brushes, which it already used to, but now it's more brushes um, because we have the Essentials Asset Library nowadays. And in this, in this Essentials Asset Library, we can in future ship a lot of new assets that make Blender much more usable out of the box. And this is also a very visual way to um, show people the features. So if you enter Sculpt mode now, you see something like this at the bottom of the 3D view. You see brushes with previews, and they can really tell you what you can do in this mode, right? Um, and we expect that we are going to bundle Blender with a whole bunch of brushes in the future. It's probably going to be a few hundred, hundreds of brushes that come bundled with Blender. Um, but it's also just very easy, it's going to be very easy to collect your own brushes. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of new default brushes. We have uh, these contrast brushes, transform, transform brushes, and they're all brushes that um, mostly Julian Kaspar curated and made new uh, previews for, and he put a lot of effort into making the, those previews work really well with all kinds of themes and uh, making them clear visual language and also making it easy to reproduce and to make your own brush previews that look similar to this. Uh, so a whole bunch of effort went into these essential brushes, um, the simulation brushes, very nice and visual. And another part of this project was uh, the UI to select brushes. So you've seen in, in these previous screenshots, this is the asset shelf. I already introduced it at the last, last year's uh, Blender conference, so I'm kind of skipping over that now. But now we also have this uh, brush asset selector, which is a pop-up that you can call at any time, shift space by default, uh, and then you can just type in the brush name, enter, and you get that brush, which is a workflow that a lot of people were asking for because it's you switch brushes a lot if you're doing painting or sculpting work. So a very fast brush switching workflow is important. But here comes, in my opinion, the best part. You don't, brushes are now sort of in a global collection. Like you use asset libraries and these brushes are stored in these asset libraries. You don't have to keep, the brushes are not just in your plant file anymore. You can just uh, reuse the same brushes for many different projects and it's very easy now to add brushes to that library. Basically, all you have to do is you just duplicate the asset. You go to this operator, you can right click a brush, for example, and then select duplicate asset. And it's gonna give you a new brush asset that is stored in your asset library. Um, and it's gonna be available from all plant files, basically. And then you can do further edits. You can uh, edit the metadata, change the preview image. Uh, you can tweak the asset and save the changes. And then it's gonna save that in the plant file again, in the, in the asset library again. Um, so I think that's quite a workflow change. Uh, it's really gonna change how uh, people work with, with brushes. 
Um, yeah, there's also a little hint like if you do changes, it's going to show it up, show it, and then you know to save this. This is a bit new, and people online haven't seen it much yet, so I want to highlight it, highlight it a bit. Um, so yeah, in essence, it's a new brush assets workflow, um, or a new brush workflow that's based on this on the power of the asset system and brings all of its features, giving you this sort of global brush palette. Um, it's really unified through paint and sculpt modes. So like all the, all the modes that use brushes use this new system, then use the same UI. Uh, even in the image editor for image editor painting, it also uses, it has the asset shelf, it has all the brush features. Um, we have a whole bunch, well, we have the essentials asset library and in there there are some new um, bundled brushes and I expect that this uh, list of bundled brushes will increase a lot store. You can sort of edit the assets from your library on the fly, just make changes, save it to your library, they're available everywhere. Um, and we really put a lot of effort into the user interfaces for accessing these brushes and uh, editing them. It's also very easy to just assign a shortcut, say right click, assign shortcut, and you have a shortcut for your brush. Uh, you can also still, uh, for example, increase pencil mode, you have the eraser tool still, which allows you to use your eraser brushes. You can also just right click that and say um, assign shortcut. Um, but you don't need to use the tools. You can just use the brushes and the tool switching happens in the background. So um, it's all fine. I do want to hint a little bit at the next step for uh, assets because, um, yeah, again, I think this is a very important topic for usability, um, assets in general, and being having a nicer experience out of the box for Blender and being able to just uh, set up your workflows with assets independent of projects. And sort of the next uh, step, the next project that we want to work on that on for that is the online assets so that you can also access brushes from different markets, but also for the for studios, for example, uh, if you have like a remote uh, repository for post assets or so, something like that. But also for the Blender Essentials platform, we want a collection of assets that is hosted on the on extensions.blender.org that people can just use. Uh, they can just say, I want to use internet, and then they basically get access to all of these extra assets that are not even bundled in Blender, but are very easy to access. Um, so that's the next step for the online assets. Coming back more to these interface module, um, a few years ago we started this project for, or we started this effort on the human interface guidelines because we think it's ensuring a consistent experience throughout Blender can be very difficult, uh, especially if you think about how many developers are working on this and how few user interface um, module involvement there can be practically because we cannot be everywhere all at once. Um, <laughs> um, but also uh, there are a lot of people are making a lot of add-ons out there and it would be nice, like we really want to make sure, or really want to do our best so that these add-ons can follow the same uh, user interface principle so that they feel like native Blender features. Um, and the user interface guidelines are an important um, step for that. Like we put a bit of effort into this, but we still need help with them. So if there is somebody who has experience working on these kind of guidelines, we would really appreciate some help um, because we're quite busy also with actual things inside Blender. Uh, it would be amazing if people could help out there a bit. <clears throat> All right. So, actually, to go back a little bit on the on this on the human interface guidelines. <clears throat> so the guidelines are important. Actually, our friends over at Penpot are about to uh, uh, implement extensions add-ons themselves. And uh, one of the things that we recommend as a blender, if I had to go back, is that the day add-ons are implemented back in, well, you could do it in 2.4, but 2.5 was like the big thing. We should have had a guideline because add-ons look like add-ons because they want to, because they don't have a guide to follow. But actually you can make blender, like blender itself could, um, it, it looks, it's made the same way as add-ons. So um, if you have a proper way, like text should be aligned this way, no semicolon, no columns, no uh, no boxes. Why a box inside a box inside a box? <laughs> Things like that. So, um, the, but that's a community effort, same as the Blender Pempot uh, library. We have a uh, library for icons that actually I have it here open. I happen to have it, and it's uh, already available, accessible right here. There you go. 
It says the life of Intel, but maybe you can put it under the Blender name. It's taking all credit for an entire <laughs> community worth of icons. So you can get the icon sets to make your own mockups. And this is just the icons, but we already have a working prototype of uh, the entire Blender UI, all the widgets, like, uh, oh, add a menu, drag and drop from, from Pempot uh, components library, drag and drop uh, your menu, add an item, and uh, with the auto layout, the auto grid, it's Super, super nice. So we're going to be releasing that because we use it ourselves for our own mockups. So we hope to, um, to to share it with the world so people don't have to um, you know, remake a GIMP Inkscape Krita file for making mockups. That being said, we also have a web format for this, which is called ui.blender.org. Uh, slash icons. It's a weird uh, UI, but it is a, an experiment, <laughs> uh, a project that we did with Francesco once because I was tired of going into these giant. We used to have a, one single file for every all 700 icons of Blender in one Inkscape file, and uh, now that has been split into multiple icons thanks to Harley, and this um, makes things much easier. And also this way you can actually search for them and see the names and categories and see it huge or not. So um, this makes it easier if you're making mockups uh, or you forgot how the icons are, find them here. It's a nice uh, quiz game, you know, like uh, if you want, if you're having uh, some drinks with friends at home and you want to be like, all right, so what's the name of the icon for, I don't know, a checkbox or, <laughs> or the, there is some, <laughs> there is some really, some really weird one. Some like, there is one that is called ugly, <laughs> ugly package. What's wrong with that package? And there is no pretty package. It's just package. So uh, there is a lot of fun to have had here. And the monkey is twice, mesh monkey and the monkey. Um, that being said, okay, let's go back. Sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, next, what's next for the for the team? A project. We are planning to work on because we keep talking about a module, 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 module. But I think Blender should, should not think too much about modules. Well, yeah, for getting things done maybe in a more organizational organizational way. But projects, everything is a project that involves multiple modules. Like we saw at the beginning with that uh, slide that had many. Um, improvements for modeling, right? Like overlays. Uh, but sometimes also like I, we didn't add it here, but, but part of my, the work I did this year was actually implementing, uh, implementing, no, <laughs> designing some beautiful strips for the video sequence editor, just uh, expecting someone to take over the giant work of adding rounded corners and nice shadings and uh, add us to cover the task. And that was implemented in this, the past year. So thank you for that for <laughs> rounded corners. <laughs> and... <laughs> but then we also had help by uh, Jack with the search, with the recent items on search. That's considered UI, and we take credit for that, but it's actually someone else, or Pratik too, or Habib, or it, everyone uh, here, Dalai, Francesco even. Um, everyone uh, really contributes to, the team, to, the, to this overall project. But what about one project? Well, there are some ideas, right? Sure. We have some, some ideas over here, but what about that? I mean, the, the, basically the idea, like, if you watch that, uh, if you listened for the last 40 or something minutes, um, there was a lot of small things all over the place, right? And um, there is, this was very much needed, like, Blender has a lot of catching up to do, I think. Um, and that's sort of in the beginning, there was a slide with a polishing question mark. Kind of what we actually did, was it polishing? I don't know. It's sort of catching up and getting things to a sane state. Um, and it was just a lot of small things all over the place. But there are some a bit more complicated tasks that require a bit more effort that are not something that one developer can do. And that's why we started uh, thinking about doing these projects together. Um, also, frankly, over the last year or so, one or two years, we had to sort of learn how to work together again um, because the user interface module was not really uh, that active. We didn't have active module meetings. Um, we just had, we didn't really have roadmap or planning. It was just a lot of contributions from all over the place and it was sort of very random. And in a sense, that's powerful, but it's also, it makes it very hard to get something organized and to um, get anything done that's a bit more than a small feature or so. 
Here we have a list, a uh, little uh, bubble of a bunch of possible projects that we could work on, right? And you can expand this infinitely. There are so many things that we would like to work on. Um, we have to see what the priorities are a bit. But honestly, pick any two or three out of these. Like, if we can get two or three out of these done within the next year or so, it would already be a great step, I think. Um, but we have to get started somewhere. Um, so we are probably gonna the, sort of the first project that we picked that we might uh, that we are interested in looking into, um, not because it's necessarily high priori priority, but because it's uh, something that we feel confident we can use as an as a as a project to get started with is the project that happens to be the biggest here, which is the editor tabs. Um, and again, I don't even think that it's the highest priority one, but. This is, I think, something where we can, that is a bit low. Um, like, if we fail, it's okay, right? If we cannot get this done, it's okay. Like, nobody is going to uh, depend on this project, basically, that much. Um, so we can do some experiments, and we really want to uh, get into m doing mock-ups, some prototypes, and see um, what we can get out of this. Um, there are some things that are not really user interface module on this uh, list, in this world map, in this world map. Um, for example, fake user, and it's like even grayed out on this list. Um, but you all know the, many of you might know the whole discussion about the fake user and the fact that basically Blender can delete data if you don't say it's a stupid fake user. And that is still a very big issue. Um, it's grayed out here and pretty small, not because we're not planning to work on this. The issue is it's not really uh, just user interface. Um, it's not just our module that has to work on this. We have to work with some people from another module, uh, mostly the core module to get this done. So we do want to have this project project at some point, but we cannot just say uh, we are going to work on this now because we depend on other people. That's main, mainly the thing. Um, yeah, there is a bunch of pretty exciting stuff on that. On that. Um, and hopefully we are going to see some results coming out of that at some point, but there are no guarantees we have to really get started with something, with some project. And it's going to be the editor tabs. We'll see where this goes. And then, that's it, I guess. Yeah. How much time do we have? Seven minutes? Five minutes? Seven minutes. Should we do Q&A or not? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think we have some minutes if you uh, want to. <laughs> oh, OK. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, wait. Uh, do we have a microphone, another microphone? Oh, we, we just repeat it. Ah. Just repeat it. Videos in the tool tips. Uh, you have to str either stream that somewhere from the internet or like, wow, that's many levels. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, our current code would make that difficult. We have a hard time um, with animation or um, changes in small areas, uh, smaller than a a region. Yeah. So if we can get to animation, we could do um, yeah, video previews. Yeah. It's probably not the highest priority, but uh, I think where it's a bit more important uh, is for animation previews. When you have, for example, post assets on there, you might want to have animation previews. So in that sense, it's, a bit in it's, a it's quite interesting. Uh, but there are no plans for, like, for the tooltips or so anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question. Yes. Um, Tom? Assuming Do if you have an issue with the user interface, do you report that as a bug? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, think long, uh, right, Bradic? Uh, if you are here, a triaging team, Richard, should it be reported as a bug? It will be uh, get assigned as a user interface. If it's something that you're maybe uh, just not sure, you can always jump in the chat on uh, chat.blender.org. There is a user interface uh, channel, so it's uh, it's just everyone is welcome to just say it's like, is it really a bug or a feature? Uh, <laughs> that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. These, uh, these items on the, on the topic cloud, do these all have development documentation already? 
if these items in here, do they all have developer documentation? Uh, no, not all. They are all dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them are, yes, dream or uh, wish list. Except for complex text, text rendering, which I mentioned at last uh, conference, that I was close. I'm still just close. Um, <laughs> I have it working quite well for, um, say, Hebrew, and I have some weird issues with, with Arabic that I'm having a hard time debugging. So it's like I'm, I've got a PR that's got us 95% of the way to dealing with all these right to left and complex languages, but I'm going to need help for that last little bit. Because, yeah, debugging is hard when I don't recognize the input characters as, you know, a language, and the output characters don't make sense either, and when they're not quite working, you know, and they're backwards. <laughs> I find it difficult, so I just need help. And just to be clear, like these projects, part of the project is the, the design. Like we have to figure out the design for all of these things, basically. And that's actually sometimes, well, it is not the hardest part because the implementation is also really hard, but it is a big part of the projects. Some of them are designed, some of them are even work in progress, like the light theme. So it's, I think I'm going to try to get it for 4.3 even because it's. Uh, it's not the official theme, so we are allowed to, uh, while in beta, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, we're welcome with, like, one of my, I hope we can tackle soon is a Kimap editor. There is even a design from a uh, long time ago, uh, but yeah, that's one of them. Any other question? Here. In the absence of written down human interface guidelines, what or who is the best resource to get the answer to the question? Does this conform to them or not? Can you show the guidelines website? Pablo. <laughs> oh yeah, basically in the absence of human interface guidelines, who to consult on guidelines basically, right? How should you do UI? Um, there, are, there are guidelines, right? And um, um, I can show you. They're basically just quite incomplete still and we need to put more work into it. Okay, if you go to the developer documentation, uh, developer.blender.org slash docs, you can go to features and user interface, and then you have the human interface guidelines. These should become a top level navigation item once they're more complete. Um, but basically, this is where this is, and there is a fair bit of content already about writing style and that kind of stuff. But you can always ask us in the chat, um, and then something, we might even have to discuss this ourselves, probably we'll have to. Um, but um, many things you can just copy other user interfaces other parts of Blender. That's also always a decent approach to things. Yeah. When in doubt, look for another Blender solution. Yeah. I love the new brushes. That's looking incredible. I was doing many times like kind of pressure. Uh, any chance you guys are incorporating tilt into any of those? That is an example of a question that you would, that is. Question, repeat the question. Uh, she's basically asking if uh, we have plans to incorporate tilt in, in brushes, right? That is a question that you would have to ask the Sculpt Paint module, basically, because we are just sort of, well, I am sort of working on the user interface and the brush management side of it, together with other people, of course. Um, they know about the internals of how the brushes work and the features that they want to add there. But it's also related to like the input in general, right? If we want to make Blender work on iPad, you know, you also need some other kind of input or on an Android tablet or even on a Wacom <laughs> tablet, but properly. We don't have any kind of uh, telemetry in, uh, sorry, sorry. If, uh, if, if there is any kind of uh, log that the user can turn on to tell developers like, hey, uh, this is how I work. Maybe this helps, of course, all anonymized. Um, but no, there is no telemetry of any kind in Blender. However, now that we have the extensions platform, we have a, we, people can turn on uh, extensions online. Now I think it would be a good moment to, to start experimenting with this because if we make an extension that it's in the extension platform that the user turn on online uh, repository, online access, then uh, telemetry, and then see what is going on. They can see the code, everything. Uh, maybe it would be a good moment to, to do it because there is some really valuable data that could be used. For example, how many windows are the, the user is using or which, what is the screen size, the typical screen size crashes, right? How many 
clicks it takes to take a, to perform an action, for example. It's it's huge. I don't know of any other open source uh, project that is doing it that we could look up for uh, reference. But uh, it would be great if you have any ideas or even if you started your own. I think at some point there was uh, I think John Dennings was uh, he had a. a a branch of Blender, a completely different build that would log, it would save to the to the hard drive a log of the process, and they would be they could share that. But now with the extension platform, we could even have it online and public, of course, everything and anonymized. Yeah. Any other questions? Ah, yes, yeah, sir. A bad UX. Yeah. It's very easy to add a bad UX. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the right. safeguards are based. The question was uh, if there are any safeguards against a programmers adding bad user interface or bad experiences. Um, basically, yes and no. Like if somebody with commit access does this, it happens, right? And then often what happens is uh, Pablo looks over features for the release notes and then he notices a crappy UI and then we freak out last minute and try to fix it somehow. <laughs> that happens fairly often actually. Um, in practice, there is a review process and people know to ask us for help. Um, sometimes that works better, sometimes not so well, but it's fine. We get along, it works somehow, but can be improved. Yes. Any other questions? Very good. All right. Have a uh, go uh, see the last uh, presentation, the, the closing note by, Kin, the, by Ton. Also streamed in other places. Not everybody has to be in the, in the main uh, place, but thank you. <laughs>